Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-Level Biology for the AQA specification, focusing on organisms exchanging substances with their environment, and in particular, on gas exchange. I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-Level Biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button. And whilst you're watching, feel free to leave any comments down below of anything you're unsure about, and let us know if it's your first time watching so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the specification. So, let's get started. Welcome to lesson 2A of 4 in this tutorial, Gas Exchange. This is the second lesson in our series of four videos on the topic of exchange. In the last lesson, we learned about how surface area to volume ratio will affect the rate of exchange. Here are the AQA specification points we'll be covering in this tutorial. Feel free to pause the video now and have a quick read through them before we begin. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. The first is to look at gas exchange, then at the structure and function of respiratory organs. We will then look at some pathologies of the human respiratory system. We'll start with adaptations for gas exchange in single-celled organisms. So how does gas exchange work in unicellular organisms? In unicellular organisms, gas exchanges occur via something called the cell membrane. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are small enough to pass through the cell membranes without any trouble. Gas exchanges across membranes are carried out through simple diffusion. Oxygen, which is in a higher concentration in the environment, diffuses across the membrane into the cell. Whilst carbon dioxide, which is in higher concentrations inside the cell, is going to diffuse out into the environment. Both of the gases diffuse across a concentration gradient. Amoeba proteus is a single-celled organism which uses this system for gas exchange. Try to remember this organism in case you're asked to provide an example of a unicellular organism which uses its cell membrane to carry out gas exchange. We'll now move on to our next specification point. How does gas exchange work in insects? Insects have a tough exoskeleton, which helps to prevent them from losing water from their bodies, as well as protecting them from their environment. Because of their structure, exoskeletons are usually too thick for gas exchange by a simple diffusion. Gas exchange has to occur via a special organ system known as the tracheal system. It's a very simple respiratory system found in many insects. We'll run through it here. First, air enters the body of the insects through spiracles. Spiracles are small, microscopic holes which allow air to enter into the body of the insect. They are opened or closed and are controlled by specialised muscles. We can see the air sacs here. Spiracles transfer the air to thin tubes called the trachea. These trachea then branch into smaller tubes known as tracheoles, which deliver the oxygen to the cells and tissues of the insect. The walls of the trachea are lined with chitin to prevent them from collapsing. The tracheal system contains a special fluid for carrying oxygen. Oxygen in the air enters the tracheal system and is dissolved into this special fluid. 
Once this fluid reaches the individual cells, simple diffusion will allow for the oxygen to enter the cells and the carbon dioxide can enter the fluid. The carbon dioxide is then released into the environment through the spiracles. Breathing isn't passive in insects. They use their abdominal muscles to contract and move air in and out of the system. Now let's look at fish. How do fish perform gas exchange? Fish are aquatic organisms. To get the oxygen out of water, fish have developed a specialised respiratory system with gills. Fish live in a lower oxygen environment compared to humans. There is a lower partial pressure of oxygen in seawater compared to atmospheric air. Here, we can see that they have something called gill slits, which are positioned on either side of their heads. These gill slits are separated from each other by a thin piece of bone known as the gill arch. We'll now look at some plant gas exchange. How does gas exchange work in plants? Mesophyll cells are on the surface of the plant leaves. As shown here, these cells have a lower epidermis and an upper epidermis. Gas exchange in the leaves occurs through the stomata on the lower epidermis. Most plants use a stoma for gas exchange. Stoma are openings which allow for the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Similar to the spiracles in insects, stoma can be opened or closed depending on the needs of the plant. This opening and closing is closely regulated by specialised guard cells. Here, we can see that the guard cells are these two shirt cells that look like beans. The guard cells will close when the plant has lost too much water and open when gas exchange needs to be maximised. In plant leaves, approximately 50% of the volume is air space. The presence of air spaces is necessary in order to allow for the proper circulation of oxygen, carbon dioxide and water vapour. Unlike other organisms, plants are reliant on both carbon dioxide and oxygen. So where does this gas exchange take place? First, it can happen during photosynthesis which occurs in most plants during the day, when they take in carbon dioxide through the stoma and release oxygen into the environment. Also, it occurs during respiration, which occurs in most plants at night. They take in oxygen through the stoma and release carbon dioxide into the environment. Carbon dioxide and oxygen can both enter and exit the stoma by simple diffusion down their concentration gradients. Now we will look at some compromises in plants. How does water loss happen in plants? Like all organisms, plants require water. They store this in their leaves as water vapour. Water can be lost in a plant through something called transpiration. During transpiration, Water vapour can diffuse out of the plant leaves through the stoma. There is a balance between gas exchange and water loss. Keeping the stomata open all the time would lead to too much water loss. However, closing the stomata would permanently disrupt gas exchange. Plants have some adaptations to strike the best balance. The stomata are found on the underside of leaves to further minimise transpiration due to the sun's heat. The upper layer of the plant leaves is a waxy layer called the cuticle. This also helps to minimise the water loss through transpiration. 
they also have guard cells to make sure stomata open during the day to maximise gas exchange, and at the same time that photosynthesis is happening in the sunlight. But guard cells can close quickly if water is in shortage. Here, we can see the stomata opening and closing. Stomata will open when the water supply is good. In the presence of a good supply of water, guard cells will swell up with water and become turgid. As their volume increases, they push against each other, leading to the opening of the stoma. The turgidity of guard cells is caused by the pumping of potassium ions out of the guard cells via active transport. Stomata will also close at night. Pumping of the potassium ions is activated by other factors such as the presence of light and if the plant is photosynthesizing. In the absence of light, the pumping of potassium ions will stop. The guard cells will lose their water and turgidity. This causes them to relax and the stomata will close. Now let's look at xerophytic plants. These will live in very hot and dry conditions, so need to be adapted to them. Cacti are xerophytes. Due to the heat of the environment and the low water vapour in the air, the risk of losing water through transpiration is very high in xerophytes. Xerophytes have developed several adaptations to survive. Their stomata fall inwards into sunken pits, which traps a layer of moist air. The water vapour in this air reduces the water potential gradient between the mesophyll cells and the surface of the leaf, reducing water loss. Secondly, having fewer stomata means less water loss. They also have a thick waxy cuticle. They have a much thicker cuticle layer than other plants in order to reduce water loss. Their cuticle is also shiny, which reflects the sunlight away. They also have thick stems, which minimises the loss of water. Their large root systems mean that they maximise the amount of water they can get from the ground. Xerophytes normally either have very thick leaves or their leaves are pointed spines, like the thorns on a cactus. This minimises their surface area for water loss. The shape of the leaves is also curved to trap a layer of humid insulating air. Finally, in this video, we will look at the compromises in insects. How does water loss happen in insects? To finish off, we need to look at the adaptations to reduce water loss. They have specialised muscles to close the spiracles and prevent losing water. Also, they have hairs on the spiracles to trap a layer of moist air. Finally, they also have a thick cuticle to prevent water loss. We've now covered all the specification points for this lesson. Feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch anything you didn't understand. We'll be covering the last two points in our next tutorial. We've now completed Lesson 2A. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure to subscribe by clicking down below and leaving a comment of the topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch the rest of our videos in our A-Level Biology series, or visit our website, studymind.co.uk, for past paper compilations by topic and specification.